name to which a person is baptized. When you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you are baptized into the very identity of God. This is who God is. Amen. Now, right now, there are denominations that are debating over the use of what they consider to be the archaic language in reference to God. There are denominations, including my own denomination, I'm United Methodist, that has, and some have already begun doing it. The Presbyterian Church, USA, has already begun to do this. They are baptizing people in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. No longer Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the problem with Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer is it doesn't give to us the very identity of God. How many of you realize that the Father is Creator, the Son is Creator, and the Holy Spirit is Creator? Yes. How many of you realize that the Father is Redeemer, the Son is Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit is Redeemer? Amen? Amen. The Father is Sanctifier, the Son is Sanctifier, and the Holy Spirit is Sanctifier. Amen. So the problem is the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer doesn't give to us the very identity of God. Now, I'm going to talk about just for a moment just one other example of this, and I don't mean to pick on my oneness Pentecostal sisters and brothers. But many of you know that there are Pentecostal denominations, they're called oneness Pentecostals, that baptize in the name of Jesus. They baptize in the name of Jesus. Now, the problem with baptizing in the name of Jesus is it doesn't give to us the very identity of God. It doesn't give to us the very identity of God. All right. You're thinking, okay, well, where, where are we right now in this, uh, this uh, person and work of Jesus Christ? I'm going back to our very first question. I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbor and answer this question. Who is the subject of the incarnation? Take a moment, turn to your neighbor and answer that question. Who is the subject of the incarnation? <laughs> All right. All right, let's say it together. The subject of the incarnation is the eternal Son of God. He is the subject of the incarnation. He is the one that we are talking about. All right. Now, I want to pick up with the opening statements, Christological statements that we find in the Apostles' Creed and sort of work our way through it. And right now, let me see your hands. This is where we are. We're beginning with the Son as God. The Son as God. That's where we are. All right. So the opening statements in the Apostles' Creed says, And in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. I just want to begin by pointing out that conjunction and in the preposition in. And in. You will notice that that goes back to the opening statement of the Creed. I believe in. There are three ends in the Apostle Creed. Three prepositions. I believe in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. So the creed is being very clear here that our belief, our faith, our commitment, our trust is directed to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So our faith, our trust, our hope, our confidence, our obedience, and our commitment is directed to the Father, and more specifically here, it is directed to uh, the Son. And in Jesus... I mentioned to you earlier Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. But as he considered this, that is Joseph, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for He will save His people from their sins. Does anybody remember uh, Jesus? In the, in the uh, Greek, it's Jesus. But in the Hebrew, it's Yahshua. But we would translate Yahshua as Joshua. Joshua. So, 
Jesus or Joshua literally means Yahweh saves. The Lord saves. And we see even in this name that is given to the eternal Son of God in the incarnation, we see a clue as to His identity. We are talking about Yahweh. We are talking about the personal God of Israel, Yahweh. And we also see in His name, His mission saves. And He will save His people from their sins. Now, there are a lot of problems and issues that we face as human beings. And we can talk about we face many enemies in this life. But make no mistake, at the very heart of all of this is the issue of sin. And so the mission of Jesus Christ, the mission of the incarnate, eternal Son of God is to save us from our sin. So this is going to be something we're going to explore, explore a little bit later in the week. How does the eternal Son of God, the incarnate Son of God, how does Jesus save us from our sins? This is part of the work of Jesus Christ that we're going to be exploring. But we're not there yet. Let me see your hands. A little bit of movement here. You guys are so good. Especially for those of you who sat for two hours, two and a half hours already. All right, that's right. Eternal Son of God. Jesus. Next is Christ. And in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the name that is given to the eternal Son of God. Christ is not a name. But it's a title that is given to Jesus. The word Christ comes from the Greek Christos, which means anointed one. In the Hebrew, it is the word Messiah, which literally means anointed one. You will see, though, that in the Old Testament, we have three offices in the Old Testament which were Messiahs, anointed ones. Uh, we see that prophets are Messiahs. They are anointed ones. We see that priests are Messiahs. They are anointed ones. There are kings that are Messiahs and anointed ones. But principally, when the word Christ and when the word Messiah is used in the Old Testament, and certainly as it comes to a meaning in the New Testament, it has reference to one who is not simply a Messiah, but one who is the Messiah. The one who will come and fulfill the offices of prophet, priest, and king. We see that Christ is recognized as the Messiah. We see that the incarnate Son of God, Jesus, is recognized as the Messiah on the day of His birth. You remember the angels appeared to the shepherd and said, Today in the city of David, Christ is born. The Messiah is, uh, is born. We see this proclaimed at Jesus' baptism that He is not just simply a Messiah, but He is the long-awaited. He is the long-expected uh, Messiah. We see that this is what Peter declares on the day of Pentecost when he preaches the first Christian message. And Peter says on the day of Pentecost, speaking of God the Father, and He has made Him, that is Jesus, has made Him both Lord and Christ, the, the Messiah. Alright, so in Jesus Christ, He is the anointed one. He is the long-expected Messiah. The one who will bring together the offices of prophet, priest, and king. And then the Apostles' Creed says, His only Son. His only Son. Now here, we come to the very heart and the very identity of the one who has come to us in the incarnation. Now, what's important to realize is this. You and I, when we read the New Testament and we see this designation of Son of God, we immediately recognize that we're talking about the eternal Son of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. But that would not necessarily be immediately clear to those who would be reading the New Testament text. It may not be immediately clear. 
And the reason why that is, is because there are people in the Old Testament who are called Son of God. So we see that there are angels in the Old Testament who are called Son of God. Adam is called Son of God. We see that there are some kings in Israel that are called Son of God. And then in the end, we see that the nation of Israel is called a Son of God. And so we see that there are people, angels, nation that is called the Son of God. But when the New Testament refers to Jesus Christ as Son of God, it is referring to Christ as Son of God in a way that is wholly different than it has ever been used before in the Old Testament. It is the distinction that we will say there is a Son that is a Son by adoption. Adam, kings, angels, Israel are sons of God by adoption. How many of you realize that you're children of God? Do I hear an amen? amen? You are the daughters and you are the sons of God. But you are the daughters and sons of God by adoption. You are not a son or a daughter by nature, are you? And so we see that not only is Jesus the Christ. But we also see that He is the Son of God. And He is the Son of God in a wholly different way than anyone else has ever been a Son of God before. He is not a Son by adoption, but He is a Son by nature. He is a Son by nature. And we see this in a number of places. We see this at Christ's baptism and His transfiguration in which Father says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We see that Jesus in His ministry would make a distinction when He would talk about my Father and your Father. Again, distinguishing the type of sonship that existed that He had in those He was doing ministry towards. We see that Jesus calls Himself, and this is very clear, the only Son of God. You know this. John 3.16, say it with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. His only begotten Son. It is the only, He is the only one who can say that He is a Son by nature and not a Son by adoption. Again, we see this in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. In which uh, John writes, We beheld His glory, the glory of the only Son of God. This is at the end of, uh, of page 2. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only Son of God. <laughs> so He's a Son by nature. Now, I want to take just a moment and I want to talk about what do we mean when we say that He is the eternally begotten Son of God? And you'll see this a little bit on my, my slide here. We say, how many of you have heard in here at some point along the way that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God? Yeah. Do I hear an amen? amen? He is the eternal Son of God. His Sonship does not have a beginning in time. But this is the problem. Our natural way of thinking about the Son is to think about it in human terms. And we know that a Father precedes in existence the Son. And so many times when we hear that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God, we naturally think the Father preceded in existence the Son. That somehow the Son comes into existence after the Father or exists after the Father. Do I hear an amen? I mean, that is, that is our natural way. Shudder the thought. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Shudder the thought. That is our natural way of thinking about it. So I want to, we use this language of eternally begotten Son of God. 
But I want to be sure to clarify what we mean and what we don't mean when we say that the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. So, this is on page 3. What does it mean to say that Jesus is the eternally begotten Son of God? Well, this is what we do mean. This is the similarity with human begetting. And this is the most important, and that is like begets like. So, for instance, I have begotten a son. I've also begotten a daughter. Now, hopefully you would recognize that I, Chris Bounds, am a human being. I am you. Do I hear an amen? amen? Now, I know that there would be students. There would probably been some parishioners uh, across the way that have questioned my humanity. <laughs> but I am human. So, what that means is if I, Chris Bounds, have begotten a son, I have begotten another human being. Amen? Amen. I didn't beget a monkey, did I? I didn't beget a donkey. Although there may be times I've thought about that in regards to my son. Maybe a few moments I've thought about that in reference to myself. Not a monkey, not a donkey, not a zebra, not a cat, not a lion. I, as a human being, have begotten, have begotten the same nature that I am. I am human, and I have begotten human. What this is to recognize is that God begets God. To say that the Father has begotten a Son is to say that He has begotten one who's of the same nature, of the same substance as the Father. He is God. He is God. Also, and second of all, this is to recognize that in fact the Son does have His source in the Father. He has a source in the Father. Now, what are the differences between divine and human begetting? What are the differences? Well, human begetting involves a mother. Divine doesn't. God hasn't had a consort. God has not had a wife for all of eternity through whom He has begotten a Son. So that's a big difference between divine begetting and human begetting. A human father precedes the existence of the Son. Divine doesn't. That the begetting of the Son, the existence of the Father and the existence of the Son are simultaneous with each other. The best analogy that has been used in the history of Christianity to illustrate this is the idea of light and heat from the Son. How many of you realize that light and heat have its source in the sun? Do I hear an amen? amen? But how many of you realize as soon as you have the sun, you have light and heat? Yeah. So here is just an analogy of something that has its source in another and yet is simultaneous with another. Also, we see human begetting is in time and space, whereas divine begetting isn't. We see in human begetting, the son grows and develops. The son does not. Human father is greater than the son. The divine father and son are equal. One another. Anyway, just real quickly, sort of what do we mean when we say that the son, this eternal son of God, he is called son because he's been begotten by the father for all of eternity. And this is a distinction that we make between human begetting and divine begetting. And this is sort of what we mean when we talk about the Son being eternally begotten by the Father. One last thing, and then we'll conclude for today. And again, let me see your hands. You need some movement right now. You need some movement. Uh, this is where we are. All right? We're talking about the Son as God. We're talking about the Son as God. Uh, in our next class, we'll talk about the descent that is getting ready to, to take uh, place. But the last part of it is our Lord. Our Lord. And in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Just to let you know, the word Lord here is a translation of the Hebrew Yahweh. 
Yahweh is the personal God of Israel. It is the personal name of God. For those of you who know that Hebrew, I know that we talk about Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God. Elohim is sort of a generic designation of God. But Lord or Yahweh is the personal name of God. And so when we recognize in the creed His only Son, our Lord, what we are recognizing and acknowledging is that Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, is in fact Yahweh. He is the personal God of Israel who is also now our personal God. We see this in a, a, a couple of places. But other than, uh, let me just say this, that uh, as you see the word Lord used in the New Testament, it's used in three different ways. You can use the word Lord to show respect. And so you will see that there are times and places that people who do not necessarily recognize Christ as God, but they will refer to Him as Lord out of respect for Him. Oftentimes you would see those who are Gentiles or those who were associated with the Gentiles who would come to Christ and refer to Him as Lord. It was a term of respect. But Lord is also used as a term of affection. And we see this by Mary and Martha in the way that they talk about the Lord. And there's affection that is associated with it. So it can be a term of respect. It can be a term of affection. But in the very end, when we affirm this in the creed, when we say He is our Lord, we are affirming that He is in fact God. That He is Yahweh. This is at the very heart of the confession that we see in Romans 10.9. Many of you have Romans 10.9 uh, memorized. It says, For if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. That was the earliest confession of faith, wasn't it? Jesus is Lord. He is the personal God of Israel. And He is our personal God. As well. Now we're going to pick this up uh, tomorrow. Apologize. Well, I know some of you are asking, hey, goodness gracious, all of this, and uh, what can I apply to my life? I, I have said nothing to you that you can apply to your life. <laughs> nothing. But let me give you a word of encouragement here. Do you know the truth of God? has the power to form you and shape you without you ever asking the question of application. Do you know that? Do you know that the truth of God has the power to form you and shape you without you ever asking the question of how do I apply to my life? Can I give you a quick example of this? Now, I don't know this person. I, I, I'm used to using this person. I don't even know if you know who in the world I'm talking about. There was a person who was fairly popular, pop singer, two or three years ago. And her name was Lady Gaga. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Lady Gaga? Yeah. It took me a while to actually get the name right. <laughs> Goo Goo, Gaga, La La, La La, La. Uh, Lady Gaga. You know what I'm talking about. Even if you don't, I'll just let you know she's a pop singer. At one time, was very popular. Her followers were called Little Monsters. They were called Little Monsters. That's what they were called. Right after that, I think they were still called Little Monsters. How many of you realize that Lady Gaga, because of her popularity, because of her music, just because of her personality, that she's forming and shaping the hearts and the minds of young people? Do you hear an amen? Yes. But I will tell you, when they listen to Lady Gaga's music, and one of her most famous songs is called Born This Way. Mm -hmm. But when they're listening to Lady Gaga, they're not asking the question, okay, now how in the world do I apply born this way to my life? <laughs> and yet it is still forming and shaping their hearts and their minds. Let me just say this, how much more the Word of God, how much more the truth of God to form us and shape us without ever asking the question, how do I apply it to my life? Please hear me, we are going to be asking that question. We just haven't had a chance to ask it yet. I'm setting us up, I'm trying to establish a foundation that we can build upon in the days ahead. All right, before you leave, this is what I need for you to do. I want you to uh, take a moment. I want you to think of one thing that you're taking away 
from our time together. One thing you're taking away. It could be an insight. It could be a question. It could be something that makes you go, hmm, I'm not so sure about that. It could be something that you agree with heartily. And it might be something that you, know, you might disagree with. But what's one thing that you're taking away? And if you would, share it with your neighbor. The thing is, please hear me, this is the pedagogy in me. This is the teacher in me. The pedagogue. Uh, uh, pedagogue. Pedagogue. Uh, anyway, it's the teacher in me. It's the teacher in me. It's a way of processing and helping you process. So what's one takeaway point from what we've talked about this morning? What's one thing you're taking away from what we talked about? Share with the neighbor and you're free to go. Share with the neighbor and free to go. Oh, I'm going to